Coming to you live from our studios in Belize City, this is the Evening News on Love Television for Wednesday, August 24th. We'll take a look at the stories that are making the headlines for today. Official OAS report on April shooting of Guatemalan minor to be handed over to Belizean authorities on Thursday. Audit highlighting numerous irregularities within Immigration and Nationality Department. Belize National Teachers Union calls for appeal of Section 53 ruling and a woman murdered in Key Cocker. A little over four months ago, on April 20, 2016, 13-year-old Julio René Alvarado was killed in the Cebada area of the Chicabu Reserve in the Cayo District. It is an unfortunate incident that created heightened tensions between the Belize and Guatemalan military, as well as the foreign affairs officials from both sides. In response to that tension, coupled with Guatemala's insistence that someone from Belize be penalized for the incident, an independent investigation was launched that included a team of experts from Mexico and the United States. That report has been finalized and Belize has been exculpated from any blame as it relates to the incident. The 22-page document will be officially handed over to the Minister of Foreign Affairs tomorrow and the media was informed today that officials will not be making any statements until that presentation concludes. We did manage to get a copy of the report and while it is quite lengthy, we will share with you the highlights of the findings. In the introduction, it was stated, quote, as part of our review, we have read a number of reports, statements, interviews, and documents, as well as either meeting with and or interviewing a number of individuals. Additionally, we visited the scene of the incident at different times, accompanied by the father and another villager and local members of the OAS team who provided logistical support only, and in the case of Dr. Hamby, a translator. We both entered the scene from near the village of San Jose Las Flores de Chiquibal, which is on the Guatemala side of the adjacency zone, end of quote. In its methodology, the investigating team focused on four areas, namely recovering of data, exploring the site, analysis of the information, and conclusions. In the process of the investigation, the miner's father was interviewed and the outcome of that was posted in the section named Analysis Information. According to the interview, Mr. Carlos Alfredo Alvarado Ramirez, the child's father, who was born in the community of San Jose Las Flores de Guatemala, declared that at 7 a.m. on the morning of April 20, 2016, he had left his home with his children, Julio Rene Alvarado Ruano, whom he refers to as being 13 years old. The birth certificate indicates 14 years old and about to turn 15, and Carlos Alberto Alvarado Ruano, 12 years old. They walked to the job site that is 40 minutes from their home to plant pumpkin and bean seeds. After they had finished work while returning to their home over the hill and before they arrived at the cornfield, three men appeared and said to them, don't move, and promptly began to shoot them. In the version by the soldiers and FCD members, three persons with an intermittent flashlight started to cross into the cornfield and shot at them when Benjamin Cal said to them, stop. After the unknown people began to shoot at them, they returned fire. The document noted that in its conclusion, quote, The firearms that caused the death of the child were a .22 caliber rifle and a 12-gauge shotgun. The BDF M4 carbine did not produce any of the wounds on the deceased or wounded. The elements that we used to analyze this information were the autopsy reports, documents, interviews, and assorted photographs. Laboratory examination results from the National Forensic Science Service, the wounds, and the detention reports of the deceased minor. Additionally, we conducted our own separate and independent visits to the site of the event. End of quote. The report did note that Mr. Alvarado is a farmer, and with his sons, they planted pumpkin and bean seeds and hunted for a living. He worked as a farmer for more than 20 years and used Belizean land to plant crops. The deceased Julio Rene Alvarado Ruano had been previously detained on March 2, 2016 by BDF FCD personnel approximately 100 meters inside the adjacency zone administered by Belize. He was carrying in his crocus bag two gibnuts that had been shot. He and two other miners were hunting with a rifle according to the detention report of the FCD about this incident. 
We will have more on the findings in this investigation in tomorrow's newscast. In the with the report indicating that the gunshot sustained by the Guatemalan miner was not caused by the weapon of Belize military personnel, we asked the recently appointed chief executive officer in the Ministry of Defense to weigh in on the matter. I know that um, there is a meeting um, that took place yesterday and probably still going on today within the foreign ministry, the foreign minister and the foreign minister of Guatemala. And that is where that decision will be made. Um, at this stage, we are just happy that, as you said, the, the BDF uh, was, name was cleared, that we, we do not go about firing at, at civilians without being fired at. It will always be in self-defense. Enriquez took office on Monday, August 22nd. The Prime Minister referred to the Land Department as a hotbed of corruption some time ago. It appears, however, that the corruption is also rampant in the Department of Immigration and Nationality. An audit report that is expected to be tabled at Friday's sitting of the House of Representatives has provided damning proof of that. The report lists dozens of indiscretions as they relate to the illegal issuance of visas, passports and nationality certificates. As it relates to passports, the report noted that 55,500 and 79 passports were approved without a biometric checks during the period April 2011 to September 2013. It concludes that the passport issuance system was breached and cited several things leading to the conclusion, such as the data capture operator did not always take a live facial image of applicants, passport application forms were photocopied and did not have the identical surname as what was subsequently printed in the passports, and a number of other irregularities. The report notes that many stolen, unaccounted and fraudulent manual jumbo and ordinary passports were found among the cancelled passports presented to the audit department. It points out that there are weaknesses and a lack of control in the Belize passport issuance system. One passport that was issued was from a stolen series that was found to be missing over five years prior from the Belmopan Immigration Office. In the report, it was also found that an alleged human trafficker was able to obtain Belizean nationality by registration. There are dozens of missing passport applications and they have been found to be for the foreigners who are able to enter Belize on a visa and get their nationality within days, weeks and sometimes even months. The ever popular case of Wang Hong Kim was detailed in that report and it includes the outcome of interviews conducted with several staff members. One of the recommendations made is that a comprehensive criminal investigation has to launch into the representation made by Wong Hong Kim and the integrity of the endorsements of his two recommenders, former Minister Elvin Penner as well as Alfonso Cruz Jr. There are many other cases that are detailed and from what we have seen, the names of government ministers called in signing and pushing documents without proper, proper documentation include John Saldiva, Carlos Perdomo, Elvin Penner, Gottman Hulse, and Erwin Contreras. The Audit Department also recommends that former Director of Immigration Ruth Main be questioned by police regarding her role on the issuance of a number of passports. And they also recommend that a number of justices of the peace should have their commission revoked. One of the ministers named in the report is Minister of Tourism Manuel Heredia. The media caught up with him earlier today. I might be for one or two probably recommend recommendation not really facilitation but recommendation of one particular in my constituency kikaka the wife of a chinese over there other than that i have nothing to do personally with facilitations of visas and so but again we have to remember as politicians people will come to you for a recommendation a recommendation is merely say i know this person says the facilitation, that is the department that does that one. If any particular minister goes beyond what, then somebody else will judge them. But personally, I believe that my job is to recommend as so long as I know the person in whatever capacity probably I feel that is right. I do not go beyond that. United States Ambassador to Belize Carlos Moreno stated that he has not yet read the report, but the embassy will be assisting Belize upon request in any investigations. I'm looking forward to uh, reading it and uh, ultimately if there are ways that 
the U.S. government can assist in terms of investigations and so forth. I think uh, if we're asked to participate, we'll be happy to do so. When it comes to the issue of easy access to Belizean official documents, Ambassador Moreno stated that it is a concerning issue for the U.S. because they accept the documents presented by Belizeans on a good faith. Ambassador Moreno also commented that if a situation arises for Belize to investigate fraudulent U.S. documents presented to Belizean authorities, they will do everything to assist in investigating. That is very concerning to the United States government because as part of the U.S. visa process, you know, we rely and we expect that the documentation that is going to be presented to us is legitimate. And if there's any uh, fraud involved in the obtaining of those Belizean documents, of course, that is a very, very great concern to us because we certainly do not want people entering the United States whose credentials are false in the first instance. Uh, fraudulent U.S. documents that are presented to Belize, Belizean authorities, and that would be a great concern. So we would actively pursue any kind of fraudulent U.S. document that would be presented to, to Belize. I expect that we would uh, fully cooperate with Belizean authorities who suspected that U.S. documents were fraudulent. Ambassador Moreno could not say if any visas would be canceled as a result of the audit. Indeed, there is nothing new in hearing of the irregularities in the Immigration Department. What we have found revealing is how the system is overridden when it comes to visas, passports, and nationalities. In response, Hulse says that a new system to thwart these loopholes was developed under his rule when he got into the Ministry of Immigration. First of all, as you know, back uh, more than a year and a half ago, when I said in the Senate, let the Auditor General do their work, and they did their work. So the reports came out. The only thing I will say to start with that I understand the Auditor General did not comply with what would be a requirement to do a management letter to CEO and other people. My, I personally was never asked any question by the Auditor General, not a question by any other people. So I can't comment on that. And my understanding is that they didn't speak to the, the CEO of the ministry at the time. But apart from that, majority of the things that come out are things that we've heard some of them we have seen from the PENA um, situation and some of the things that I myself had undertook to, to look into. But I won't comment on anything specifically until it goes to the House on Friday when it's laid on the table and of course subsequently on Wednesday when it goes to the Senate. The audit report is for the period 2011 to 2013. As you have heard, Hulse spoke of new systems he brought into place when he took over the Immigration Ministry. In this interview, he goes a bit more in details as to how things have changed. He did concede, however, that he is still hearing concerns over the issuance of passports. We have a nationality committee, man. Now nobody should get a nationality unless it goes before that committee. That committee is made up of church, union, and, um, and, 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 and um, business community, as well as public officers. When I appointed them, I didn't choose them. Those are people nominated by the respective organizations. No minister can sign a nationality unless it is passed by that committee. Before it is passed by that committee, it is published. After it's passed by that committee, it's published again. People go to a public swearing in. You have all been invited. People then take an oath. A commissioner of the Supreme Court signs the certificate in the presence of everybody there. That is a tremendous advance over to the days when Penna could sign a certificate and you get it. Visas, go to a visa vetting committee which no minister can control. It's made up of CEOs and senior people. And if they say no, you never get your visa. So those are some advancement. The passport, which I still continue to hear issues about. You should not get a passport unless a category B and a category A person says so. The category B are public people. The category A are private people, but it's minister of religion, it's CEOs. They are the people to say, I know this person to be Marisol Amaya. I, that's, that's, that's the whole issue for that. And that I know this person to be a Belizean. We try to reside it in the public to get on top of all this mess and keep it away from some private individuals. On the 
new systems or not in the audit report there have been recommendations by the auditor general to have criminal investigations launched into certain cases one of those cases is in the Wan Hong Kim passport scandal where former Minister Elvin Penner and Alfonso Cruz Jr. signed on to the A&B recommender forms, saying that they have known the South Korean national for three or four years respectively. Hulse says that there have been steps taken via the cancellation of visas and the revocation of nationality of those obtained illegally. The other general recommendations are the other recommendations. We look closely at it and see where we can go with it. One of the things I want to say, though, following up on that, is that we must be careful that we do not introduce other issues over and above what has been done. You, for example, may forget that we have already clipped certain people's passports. We have already rescinded their nationality. Those things have happened. It had never happened before. And this minister will say categorically, I note that the media talked about two nationalities I signed. Yes. I gave Jules Vasquez a complete and full interview of that on, I think it was November the 2nd of last year, for two hours, explaining to him the entire process. You can want to get the clip from him and air it again. Explaining the entire process of how to, when a document comes to the minister, if it is supported by all the necessary documentation and signed off by the officers, you don't expect the minister to open up an investigation in the matter. There still have been a lot of files that have come where we, if you're not so sure, you double check and you make sure that, okay, okay. But I will say this and I'll say this forever. Those who get through the system, whenever this minister would find that in fact they did so improperly, their wings are going to be clipped. I have done that already. We've signed already rescinding orders for nationalities for people. So, and because I can do that with confidence because A, nobody gave me anything to get theirs. So whomever they gave it to or whomever they got it to, go back and get it from that person, certainly me. Minister of Tourism Manuel Heredia spoke this morning on the ruling of Section 53, which has caused commotion in many sectors of the country. Minister Heredia stated that the island of San Pedro is known to be a liberal island where private lives stay private and people respect that. As a government, uh, we respect the decision of the court. We respect the decision of, of the, the people that uh, want their, their rights to be protected. And uh, I personally believe that I am no one to, to really judge the actions of anyone. Uh, I think a previous reporter was asking, your island is known to be one that uh, has a number quite well and there is no one that bothers about what this one does or the other does you know so long as you do things in in your privacy just like a man and a woman i believe that i have to respect the rights of those people if we do anything in public anything immoral in public the law applies to me as it will apply to any other one but at this point i am comfortable that with the decision of the court and, I, and we are signatories to the human rights and protection of human rights and for that reason then and let us not try to be the judges of these people. The Belize National Teachers Union says it is deeply concerned about the Chief Justice's ruling on Section 53. The BNTU is appealing to the Prime Minister to quote ensure that this matter, which is of paramount importance to our teachers and to our vastly Christian nation state, is thoroughly ventilated and addressed, end of quote. It goes on to say our people must be allowed the opportunity to openly express their concerns and opinions on the issue and the possibility of an appeal process before it is brought to the House of Representatives. The Stan Creek branch of the National Teachers Union met yesterday in Dangriga. We get the details in this report from correspondent Harry Arzu. The Belize National Teachers Union, Stan Creek branch, rejected the government's proposal to delay the salary adjustment that was due to them from April of this year. This unanimous decision took place in a meeting that BNTU Stan Creek branch held yesterday at the Stan Creek Ecumenical College Auditorium. Maureen R. Zhu is the secretary of the said union. She spoke with Love News. After a robust and spirited discussion on the update on salary adjustment, the membership unanimously voted no to the Prime Minister's request to defer salary adjustment up to March 2017. 
In addition to the vote, our membership strongly recommends the following to the government of Belize. The Prime Minister signs the anti-corruption immediately. That the government is asking, if the government is asking us to sacrifice, then the ministers of government are supposed to set example by taking a pay cut. Institute the Integrity Commission, activate an effective public accounts committee that includes social partners, cut down on wastage as it relates to the government vehicles, that they be parked on holidays and weekends except if government work is being done. Explore other ways to generate funds of relief assistance as a result of Hurricane Earl. Encourage the government to embark on an aggressive plan to diversify the economy, create national wealth and establishment of new industries. Example, textile, manufacturing, using banana to make flour, etc. Review the roles, effectiveness, usefulness of contract officers, and where they are not necessary, they must not be contracted. Create an emergency fund that can be tapped into after a natural disaster. Finally, institute the 13th Senator for better check and balance. The membership is committed to sustain pressure if their recommendations are not considered and their salary adjustment is not met. They are requesting that the government take, if, take these matters into consideration very seriously. The executive members of BNT Houston Creek Branch include Troy Coleman as the president, Lena Bernardes, vice president, Desiree Olivas, Assistant Secretary, Nadia Callis, Treasurer, Nadia Williams and Aretha Flores are the auditors, and Bart Ellis and Leon Gentle are the trustees. Reporting full of news from Dangriga, I'm Harry Arzu. King Kaka Police found the body of 51-year-old Jennifer Diana Coleman on Aventura Street, there 30 feet away from her apartment on the south of Key Cocker last night at 11.50. Police say that Coleman was wounded inside her apartment and ran outside seeking help but died before anyone could reach her. Police have not yet established a motive for the murder of Coleman but has a suspect in custody. Police believe that the suspect is known and was known to Coleman. He is said to have visited her at least once a week. They have recorded statements from four different sources and are still investigating. Forensics department personnel found a knife in the yard where Coleman's apartment is and have sent it for analysis. They have also sent blood samples found on the suspect's shirt for analysis. Coleman was found by police with a slash on her throat. She was transported to the polyclinic where she was pronounced dead on arrival. Coleman lived alone in her apartment and was a housewife. Chief executive officers from various ministries and other government officials gathered at the Belize Biltmore Plaza in Belize City today for sessions on defense strategies. The event was a two-part event, as explained by CEO of Defense, Felix Enriquez. The stakeholders meeting. It's one in a series of meetings that are taking place to form the Belize National Defense Security Strategy. And um, what's happening today is the facilitators have gotten together the, some CEOs, some heads of departments, and key individuals from the different ministries, along with NG, some NGOs and other stakeholders, to really tell us how far we have come with the strategy and get input, mostly to get input on how the strategy will be developed, and we hope to have it released um, hopefully by the end of the year, if not early next year. CEO Enriquez speaks of a defense and a security strategy which he says should be released by next year. It is an event held every five years, and this one seeks to tackle issues from previous strategies that were not implemented. The defense strategy for this defense of Belize is one aspect of it. The security strategy, which involves what happens with other security departments in Belize, um, encompasses the national security strategy. And um, this is something that should be done every five years, like any other business cycle or cycle of this sort. And this one is being done a little after five years. It's, it's overdue, but it's really important. Um, in terms of implementation, there are some hanging fruits that will be implemented pretty quickly. But for right now, I think we're still at the stage where it's formulating. 
Minister of Home Affairs Godwin Hulse was, present, was present at today's session, while notably absent was the Minister of Defense, John Saldiva. Last Friday, Norwegian Cruise Line presented a donation of $100,000 to the Belize Red Cross to assist the people of Belize in the recovery efforts after Hurricane Earl. Norwegian Cruise Line holding Senior Vice President of Destination and Strategic Development Colin Murphy presented the donation to Lily Bowman, Director General of Belize Red Cross Society. Bowman said the donation will assist at least 170 more families in need. The Development Finance Corporation also donated to the Belize Red Cross. Representatives of DFC handed over a check of $10,000. The DFC extended a heartfelt thank you to the Belize Red Cross for its commendable work and commitment to restoring the lives of Belizeans who were affected by Hurricane Earl. The Salvation Army today handed out donations to victims of Hurricane Earl. Regional Commander Major Jolliker Leandre spoke with us about this initiative. What we are doing basically is to help families to find some sort of stability because based on the assessment that was done, we understand there are many, many needs and all those needs cannot be met by one person or one organization. So that's how we, the Salvation Army, got involved uh, via human services and to see how best we can address those, those, those needs. So today, basically, what we have started the distribution, food, food parcel distribution for quite um, two weeks ago. We are still doing that for persons who have been affected. In addition to that, we have, a, um, based on the assessment done by Human Services, there are a number of persons who have lost almost everything. And one of the uh, pressing needs have been identified as stove, kitchen utensils, um, children, um, school uh, bags, and so on and so forth. So we had decided to help in that area. We asked Major Leander how the funds to purchase the items were raised. Well, since it was a, a local disaster, we thought we could not burden the local community because most people would have been affected in one way or the other. So we started with whatever we had left from our Christmas appeal, we started with that. And then we, make, we made contact with our headquarters in Jamaica who quickly responded and they had, they had uh, assured us that they will help us as, as long as we pro provide them with the necessary information, which we did. And um, quite quickly, we got the go-ahead. So we got a grant from them to, to assist along with what we've been doing on the ground. Let me just take the opportunity to say thanks very much uh, to Love. I know Love is very much involved also and is a great of support of the Salvation Army in terms of, of what we do. So I want to really say a big thank you to you for getting our message out there. And I want to encourage other, other, other citizens, other organizations. I've seen everybody have been doing their part, but let us keep on doing what we can so that together we can make a difference. There is no one organization who can solve all the problem, even the government. So we need to work alongside the government in one way or the other to help people to have a better life. And that's the purpose of the Salvation Army being here in Belize. The Department of Human Services was also involved in the selection of the recipients. Diana Pook, Civic Education Coordinator, spoke with us more about this. I was in charge of the shelters as the shelter liaison to ensure that the shelteries got um, their needs met. And um, as another part of that, we, we are working along with the Salvation Army, looking at needs that and things that they can supply for the shelteries. And that's how um, the Salvation Army came and decided to do, um, to provide school supplies and stoves and kitchen utensils for some of the shelteries. Today, we're giving out stoves to 30 families, thanks to the Salvation Army, and, to fart and school supplies to 40 children. Initially starting the day of Hurricane Earl, we started stocking the, um, the shelters with um, food and with the water for um, the shelteries. Um, after Hurricane Earl, once the all clear was given, we opened the kitchens so that um, 
the churches assisted us with that cooking, um, a hot meal for all the shelteries and affected persons um, here in Belize City. Um, we, we also started doing assessments throughout Belize City and Belize Rural. Um, the shelteries were also assessed and we started to look at the needs that um, all our shelteries had and how we could assist them to um, reach that level of comfort, maybe not exactly what they had, but at least an 80 percent um, normalcy with them. And this is another phase, looking at um, how we can assist them, what does they need, and um, looking at agencies that can provide us with that um, type of assistance. So we'd like to thank the Salvation Army, we'd like to thank the churches, especially Trinity, um, Assemblies of God, um, the West Side Assemblies of God, um, all the churches that assisted us. We'd like to thank the BDF Batsub for, for assisting us with the cooked meals when the shelteries were in the shelters, um, and all the other agencies that helped us throughout this time. Cooks said they have a database to ensure that the neediest families are targeted. We reported to you earlier this week that Felix Enriquez was the named as the new Chief Executive Officer in the Ministry of Defense. Commander of BDF David Jones did speak positively on this new appointment, considering Enriquez's familiarity in the military. Today we got to speak with Enriquez to ask him about his new appointment and the way forward. It's where I come from. I'm a military officer by profession, if you could say it that way. Um, yes, I have a, a more rounded um, background because I started being, apart from being in the BDF, I have worked in the public service for a very long time. And my most recent post was working as a CFO in AGM Finance at the DFC. And so bring a more rounded approach to managing defense, but up to very recently, I was the commander of the BDF volunteers um, and had, uh, was actually in the regular force for a very long time. So I would say just bring a, a more rounded approach to everything. I know what we want to do for defense. I'm very familiar with General Jones and Admiral Borland. And um, I think together we could make some pretty good things happen. The post for a CEO in the Ministry of Defense became necessary when Prime Minister Bayro had the Ministry of National Security split into two ministries. This morning, the Belize Tourism Board presented five scholarships for Belizean students to pursue studies in tourism and hotel management and culinary skills at the University of Belize. Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation Manuel Heredia spoke about the issuing of the scholarships stating that they are in effort to equip Belizeans to have the industry to the next level. BTB has a responsibility to our youth and to the development of our industry. And if we want um, to empower our local people or our local Belizeans to be able to hold the high positions that the tourism industry brings about, then this is the way to go. And that is the reason why for the past five years, we have been giving the culinary and also the territory and the, and the UB a bachelor's degrees in, in, in tourism. And we will continue to do so, so long as the, the resources permit it. At this time, I believe the industry is doing well, particularly the past three years. And the, the more finances the, we have, the better we will try to guide our industry into better standards, better in culinary and the education for them. The, the industry is changing as, as every year. We started very small. Today you see Belize is at, at a peak where I myself didn't believe that we will be there. So empowering these people will see us in the future having sufficient Belizeans, Belizeans to be able to take over this tourism industry that is the backbone of uh, this country. Minister Heredia also discussed the viability for jobs for students preparing themselves in the industry. He said that with the introduction of new airlines, there will be more opportunities for students. We have been growing better than what we expected. And uh, we have been seeing a number of new airlines coming to Belize, a number of additional hotels being done. 
So as students graduate, and if our industry continues to flourish the way it is, it means to say that this particular sector will be able to cater for quite a number of our young people that are graduating in. If you see the cruise industry also, in November we're having the, employing a number of, of other young people over there. If you see, there will be a WestJet in October and hopefully in JetBlue in January. Those will create additional in, in jobs for our students, both in the airline and also in the tourism industry. So I believe that in the next couple of years, you will see a lot of job creations within this particular industry. Nisa August was a recipient of the Jean Shaw Scholarship this year. She will be pursuing a bachelor's degree in tourism management at the University of Belize. With the um, acceptance of this um, award, I can continue my study and continue my achieve my future goals in the tourism industry, of course. I'm very passionate about tourism, and that is why I chose to um, study tourism at the University of Belize. I would encourage other people. It wasn't that hard. All the asked of us was for um, a little page of our goals and aspirations, so I wrote that. Um, other um, grade reports, etc., from the um, institution that you want the scholarship to be. Five scholarships were issued. New officers were elected to serve as board members of the Toledo District Association of Village Councils. Correspondent Paul Mahong reports. The new board members were elected during Davco Toledo Annual General Meeting, as explained by Toledo Rural Community Development Officer Cordelia Salam Foreman. 35 villages were presented, and a total of 51 village council members participated in this event. Mr. Ernest Bonner, the coordinator of the Department of Rural Development, gave the presentations on the Village Council Act, DAVCO and NAVCO regulations. Election for the DAVCO Toledo Board was conducted by the Rural Community Development Officers, and as a result, Mr. Lawrence Bolon was elected as the new DAVCO President. Vice President is Mr. Gabriel Edwards, Secretary Mr. Juan Kaal, Treasurer Mr. Ray Coleman, Vice Secretary Mr. Orlando Cook, Vice Treasurer Mr. Stephen Callis, and other members, Mr. Louis Kukul, Pedro Ak, Mr. Harold Usher, and Everett Mangar. The NAVCO representative is Dr. Francis Arzu, and liquor license representative is Mr. Alberto Chaco. Newly elected DAVCO Toledo President Lawrence Bolon is chairman of Krikehute Village Council. Reporting for Love News, Paul Mahom, Bonagorda. It's Wednesday, and that means the usual Wednesday meet and greet was conducted by the Eastern Division South Police Division this afternoon. While Assistant Commissioner of Police Chester Williams is away, Senior Superintendent Dawson commented on it. Today we did the, um, the Central American Boulevard, the side that um, is in the Precinct 1 area. And as usual, we, get, we continue to get positive um, attitude, positive re report from the public. They are satisfied with the police patrol and believe that we are doing a good job. And I say the same to the public, I believe that they're very much cooperative now, they're cooperating with us much more than before, and it is uh, yielding some results. What particular concerns were voiced by the residents? They didn't have any negative concern. They were well satisfied with the patrol, the number of patrol is adequate, and the crime situation in their area is low. Do they have any um, suggestions for the police to improve the work that they're doing? I, I didn't get any such uh, concern from anybody out there. Like I said, they're, they're well satisfied and they wish that we continue what we are doing. The police officers visited businesses along Central American Boulevard. The internal events and initiatives of the Belize Defense Force are not always publicized frequently. And with that, we met up with BDF Commander David Jones to find out what's going on in the military. It so happens that a family day, which is also open to civilians, is coming up this weekend. Today we have our annual BDA Family Sports Day where we have the, the soldiers take part in sporting events to include football, basketball, volleyball and track and field events. 
um, and there's also a marathon. It's the annual Henry Osha Half Marathon that takes place um, this Saturday, where we have members of the public who take part in the half marathon. There is also a 10K and a 5K race that is open to the public. Um, Price Brax is also open to the public for that day to come in and join their families, be part of the sporting events, and it's a time for the be their families to come out have fun, enjoy themselves and relax um, in, a, in a clean and enjoyable way. And we invite the public to come out and join us. And we'd like as many um, athletes as possible who would like to be part of, in particular, the half marathon, the 10K and the 5K, to take part in the races. And we've got good um, monetary prizes for those races as well. Those marathons normally start about six in the morning. Um, they would need to call in at the headquarters and register for the race and then we will point out to them where the, the races will start. And all those races will end up here at Price Barracks where there will be award ceremony for the, for the winners immediately after the races. As Commander Jones mentioned, the races are open for the public to join in. And with that, conditioner for today is from Shannon L. Alder. It reads, quote, One of the greatest regrets in life is being what others would want you to be rather than being yourself. End of quote. This has been the Evening News on Love Television, and we'll invite you to log on to our website at www.lovefm.com for transcripts of our news stories. Thank you for watching. Have a safe and enjoyable evening. I am Taryn Butcher.